My name is Xu, and I work on the JavaScript specification as well as the V8 project. My name is Leszek, and I work as a performance engineer on the V8 VM. So Xu, what's uh, new in JavaScript these days? Yeah, a whole bunch of stuff has happened since last year, and you might recognize some of the features we're going to talk about today from some of our colleagues' 2019 Google I.O. talk, because language features take a while to be standardized and to be shipped in the browsers. The ones we're going to be talking about today have shipped. So let's start with the fun stuff. Um, like I said, we're about to, we're either shipped or about to ship quite a few syntax features that should make web devs' lives easier. For this talk, we'll be focusing on two features that'll make dealing with optional values easier. So Leshik, have you ever written code that dealt with configuration? Oh yeah, definitely. Like I was using a hash map for those things. Yeah. So I'm keeping, I'm, I'm writing this new chat app, right? Something of a strength for Google engineers. I made some network parameters configurable, which I keep in this map of configurations called config that you see on the screen. But the network configuration is optional because it isn't always set by the user. And it has sub-configurations like the server and the port, and maybe those aren't set by the user either. Handling that kind of optionality is kind of a pain. Currently, folks do this with logical and like you see on the screen. Oh, that's pretty verbose. Yeah, and for those chains of property accesses, where at any point some property in the middle could turn out to be undefined, we added this feature called optional chaining. Easier to show you on the screen than to talk you through it. So the optional chaining feature is the question mark and the dot instead of a plain dot. Oh, I see. So if net config is undefined, then net config dot server is undefined and dot adder is undefined and so forth. Yeah, almost. It's a little bit more relaxed than that. It's if it's undefined or null. And specifically, we call the set of things that are undefined or null nullish. So in the in this case, if net config is nullish, the whole optional chain is undefined. If net config isn't nullish, but net config dot server is nullish, then again the whole thing is undefined. You get the idea. If nothing is nullish, then eventually you get the the whole property, the most nested property access. Yeah, cool. That's a lot easier to read. Yeah, I think so too. Now, another common feature while dealing with configurations is default values. And sometimes folks use logical or for this, like you see on the screen. Oh yeah, I've definitely written that before. Yeah, and it usually works fine, but sometimes it doesn't. And it's, it's really surprising when it doesn't. Suppose I add a configuration for enabling compression to the, to the server. Do you spot the bug? Oh yeah, right. How do you actually explicitly disable compression, right? If it's false, then false or true is still going to be true. Yeah, exactly. If enable compression is false, false or true, like you said, is true. So what we really want to test here is not something is truthy, which is what logical or tests for, but actually if something is absent or present. And we already are familiar with that concept, that's nullish. So we introduced this new syntax feature called nullish coalescing, which is the two question marks. And that does exactly what you want here for default values. It tests for nullishness on the left-hand side. If the left-hand side is nullish, then it evaluates to the right-hand side. If the left-hand side is not nullish, then the whole thing is undefined. So in this case, enable compression is false, question mark, question mark, true, will still get you false because false is not null or undefined. But if enable compression wasn't present, if it's undefined, then you get the default value of true. That's pretty cool. What can I use it? So you can use both optional chaining and knowledge coalescing in Chrome stable today. Now, enough talking from me. This, that, that's, that was just a taste of the new features. You can find more on our website later. We'll show you the link. But you know, we add all these new syntax features, and I'm worried that supporting them all will slow down the parser. V8 is known to be fast, and I don't want to do anything to make it slower. You know what? That's a fair concern to have. Uh, when we shipped ES6 back in 2015, we actually saw a big parsing performance drop. Like this is measured on Octane on the code load benchmark. And we had this big drop uh, during this implementation phase. But actually, nowadays, parsing speed doesn't matter as much as you might think. Oh, really? Not anymore? I thought parsing was pretty expensive. Well, it's still not cheap. But in the past year, we've worked a lot to move a lot of parsing off of the main thread and be able to parse scripts while they're still loading. So imagine that Chrome sees a script like this. The HTML parser gets up to it. It sees the script and then has to pause the HTML parsing, has to download the script, parse it, execute it, and only then can it continue parsing the HTML. I know it's strictly true because of optimizations like preloading. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, this isn't actually the whole truth. And the download of the script happens a lot earlier if there's a link preload or if the preparser finds the script earlier. And if the download moves 
off of the main thread and earlier in time, then we parse and execute can move earlier too. But the thing is, the parsing itself can happen on a separate thread as well. It's only really the execute that has to happen on the main thread. In particular, if a script is marked as async, you can keep processing the HTML up until uh, the parsing of the async script is actually finished and it needs to execute. And we've had support for this basically forever, but it's been very limited. Uh, we've only been able to concurrently parse one script at a time, and we've only been able to do this for async scripts. Yeah, how come it's been so limited? Honestly, just historical technical reasons, which don't really hold anymore. So one of the first things that we did was move everything from this dedicated thread into our global thread pool, which meant that they could happen uh, at the same time in parallel. Another thing that we changed was uh, to have synchronous scripts also use this off-thread parsing functionality. I'm kind of confused. You, you said synchronous scripts, but what's the point of parsing synchronous scripts in another thread? Isn't the whole point for non-async scripts that they block the main thread? Well, that is the point for the execute. But for the parsing, even though we're parsing on a different thread, if the main thread is free, that means it can do other things. It means that the user can scroll. It means that the user can type. It means that we can execute other JavaScript, like on click handlers. So it's actually very useful to be to have this empty space here on the main thread. Ah, OK, I see. So this is a difference between improving interactivity versus just improving the loading time. Right, but we can improve loading as well. Uh, because the parsing is happening on a separate thread, uh, we can actually move it earlier. We can start parsing when the download starts. And then as data comes in from the network, we can feed it into the parser. And then the actual parse time doesn't matter as much as you might think. All that we need is for the parser to be faster than the network. Really? The networks are already pretty fast. Not always, but usually they are. Fair enough. And you know, caches are even faster. So we can't completely ignore parser performance. So we have invested a lot into improving the parser performance as well, the single threaded parser performance. Starting 2018, we put this big effort in, put some of our best engineers on it. And we've had actually very good results in improving parser performance just through programming optimization. Yeah, up and to the right. That's the kind of graph I like to see. Really fascinating stuff. I think I learned quite a bit in just the past five minutes about making parsing and compiling faster and web app performance in general. And you got me thinking about this other big chunk of web app performance, which is memory. I was doing this thing the other day with, with my chat app, and you know I got it basically working, and I was trying to measure the, the performance of the packets that I was getting from the server. I wrote this little moving average class to compute the latency moving average of, uh, of the packets that I was getting from the WebSocket. You see there that I add a message listener that basically all it does is it accumulates events into the event array. And I use that later in this compute function, which I don't show to actually compute the moving average. And the way I use that is I have this component that when I start measuring and I want to see the live statistics of the moving average of the latency, that I make a new instance of it. And then when I stop, I null it out because I don't want to keep all the events I accumulated in memory. I know that V8 garbage collects memory that can no longer be reachable. And as long as the moving average is reachable through the this.movingAverage property on the moving average component, that the garbage collector cannot collect it, which is why I nulled out. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and I thought this would work fine. But then what happened was, you know, it's a chat app. I kept it open for a while, and I opened the memory pane. I see every once in a while that a GC happens, and it moves, you know, it, it, it collects some memory. The, the memory goes down a little bit. But it's pretty clear that the trend is up and to the right. This is one of those graphs where up and to the right is actually bad. And what this was basically showing me is that it's a memory leak, right? That every GC, every time GC happened, it wasn't able to collect all the memory. So I just kept accumulating more and more memory. And eventually, if I kept this chat app open for another day or so, my computer will have ran out of memory. Memory leak. but. V8 only collects objects that you can actually reach. You nulled out your moving average uh, field. So the garbage collector should be able to reclaim its memory, shouldn't it? Yeah, so it's a common mistake, but it's still pretty subtle. I'm sure the more seasoned web developer would have spotted it right away. So what's going on is that the WebSocket is holding on to all the event listeners strongly, which means that until they are explicitly removed. Everything that is reachable via the event listener is also considered reachable and thus not collectible by the garbage collector. So you see that use of this.events.push inside the event listener. As long as that use is inside there, the whole moving average instance 
is reachable from within the event listener and thus not garbage collectible. So even when I nulled it out in the moving average component, it was still considered alive by the garbage collector. To deal with this, uh, folks often use what's called a disposable pattern, where I have a, a method that manually removes the event listener called dispose. And that's kind of annoying. And to use that, the way I would do it is before I null it out in the moving average component, I would have to remember to manually call dot dispose. What is this, C++? You have to manually manage your memory? I thought the whole point of garbage collection was that you don't have to bother with that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And it's so easy to forget it too. And this is all because the event listeners can't be garbage collected until you manually remove them. So what if there was a way to actually tell the engine don't let me keep you from garbage collecting this thing, even though it's reachable. Then you don't have to remember to manually call dispose or even need the disposable pattern. And it turns out there is a new standard feature in JavaScript that lets you do exactly this, weak refs. All right, and before we go into it, I have to give a quick disclaimer. So weak refs are an advanced feature that's hard to use correctly because garbage collection is unpredictable and very different from browser to browser. And even from and even different from run to run of the same browser. Because of that unpredictability, we didn't add weak refs to the web for many years. And you hopefully will never run into a, a memory leak or a bug that legitimately needs it. But on the rare occasion that you actually legitimately need a weak ref, finally, you can use it and fix your problem at the root. All right, back to the main programming. So how am I using weak refs here to solve the previous problem? I still have this event listener. But now, instead of directly registering that event listener function with the socket, I wrap it in a weak ref. It is the what's called the target of the weak ref. And inside the actual event listener, I deref the weak ref and I call the function. And this kind of indirection basically means that the, the function that is actually holding the moving average component alive via this.events.push is no longer kept from being garbage collected because it is a weakly held reference inside a weak ref. OK, and what does weak ref.deref uh, return? I see you're using optional chaining function call syntax here. Yeah, good eye on that. That that was not an example that we showed earlier, but like optional chaining for property, you can also optional chain a function call. So if it's undefined, then you don't end up making the call and the whole thing is undefined. But that also suggests that deref here, when the thing is actually collected, will return undefined. To recap here, what it basically means is that you have to manually call deref because we're no longer preventing the garbage collector from, from collecting the, uh, the, the event listener since it's wrapped up in a weak ref. So every time you want to access it, you have to manually deref. And if the garbage collector has collected it, then deref will return undefined. OK, so in this case, the listener is reachable by this dot listener. And once a particular moving average instance isn't reachable, then the component and the component nulls it out, then the whole thing can be collected. Right, exactly. Because we're no longer accidentally keeping moving average alive anymore via the event listener, we can go back to what I naively thought would work in the first place. When I no longer need all the data in the moving average instance, I would just nod it out and let the GC do its thing. OK. No, wait, but hold on. But now you've got this strongly held listener uh, on the actual event listener that's calling the weak ref. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. You know, I thought you wouldn't spot that, but that's exactly right. Even though with this weak ref indirection, I, I still have this event listener. Remember, the socket still keeps strongly. It just holds on to all the event listeners until I unregister it. I still have this extra event listener. So what do I do there? There is a, a companion feature to weak refs called finalization registry that lets me do the thing that's needed, which is I want the garbage collector to tell me when it has collected something so that I can perform some action at the point that an object has been collected or in GC parlance, finalized. And that feature is called finalization registry. On this slide, what you see is that I make a finalization registry. And when I add the new event listener, I also register it with the finalization registry, meaning when the inner listener, the thing that actually does the this.events.push, is collected. And remember, it's collectible now because it's held in a weak ref. When that's collected, it's going to run this function that I pass to the finalization registry asynchronously to remove the event listener, cleaning up all the excess memory. Now, again, this is an advanced feature, and hopefully, you'll never need it. So it doesn't actually pass the object itself into the finalizer. 
this is a good uh, observation there. You see that the thing that actually gets passed to the finalizer are some other values. The object that you want to observe the finalization of, that's already been collected, so you don't get that back. In this case, the thing we need to perform the finalization action to unregister are the socket and the wrapper listener, and that's what we pass to the finalization registry. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and like I said, this is a this is this is an advanced feature, and this example here is pretty dense. I recommend that you follow the link on the screen there to follow our full explainer on the v8.dev website for the feature. So with all of that work, I opened up the memory panel again. I kept my chat app on for a while. I start and stop measuring the latency, and now. I see that every time a GC does happen, it's able to reclaim basically all of the memory. And then over a longer period of time, I'm no longer accumulating memory. And yeah, it looks like I fixed the leak. That uh, looks pretty tricky. Like I've collected garbage before, and I don't do it particularly deterministically myself. Yeah, this garbage collection is not predictable. It's not, it's non-deterministic. Don't depend on it always running. And that's why we, we have kept saying that weak refs and finalization registry is an advanced feature. So, and that's a good point too, um, given the unpredictability of the garbage collector, are there other things that the engine does to make apps slimmer? Actually, yeah. It's been doing a lot of work to reduce its memory consumption. There's actually been two major projects that landed last year, uh, which have focused on this, points compression and V8 Lite. And I can actually talk about both of them very quickly. So points compression, first of all, um, you've probably heard that machines are 32-bit or 64-bit. Um, on 32-bit machines, we have 32-bit pointers. On 64-bit machines, we have 64-bit pointers. And the whole point of this, uh, no pun intended, is that 32-bit pointers can reference up to 4 gigabytes of memory. 64-bit pointers can reference up to 18 exabytes of memory, which is quite a lot more. And Chrome wants to be able to run in 64-bit so that it can access more than 4 gigabytes of memory. Yeah, Chrome definitely needs more than 4 gigs. Yeah, all right. Uh, we've all heard, we've all seen the same memes. And, you know, fair enough. If you've got a hundred tabs open with a thousand images and they're playing games and they're playing music, it's going to use up memory. But not necessarily each individual tab, not necessarily each individual V8 instance. And the key observation of points compression is that actually we can probably restrict each V8 instance to be less than four gig. And if we can restrict it to be less than four gig, that means we can pre-allocate a 4 gig area for it and force all objects to be allocated inside of that area. And now, instead of referencing those objects by a 64-bit pointer, we can reference them by an offset like this. Under pointer compression, you can take your 64-bit pointer and then you can split it in half. You can split it into a base and an offset. The base is the start of that 4 gig allocation area and the offset is the offset within it. And then you only have to store the offset on objects, which means that your pointer's got half the size. They got back to 32-bit size. Guessing it wasn't just easy as that. It definitely wasn't. Uh, it was a whole journey, and there's a whole blog post describing that journey, which was very exciting. But as a little spoiler, I can tell you that on typical websites, we reduce memory by about 40%. Yeah, that's a, those are some very impressive numbers, 40%. But what if a web app or a Node.js program really wants to use more than the four gigs? Are you constricting apps to only have four gigs of memory? Well. Kind of, but also not really. First of all, with points compression, those objects are a lot smaller, so you can fit a lot more of them into that four gigabyte allocation area. And also, this four gig only applies to a single V8 instance's JavaScript object heap. So for example, typed arrays, they have their own uh, external memory backing, so they're not included. WASM instances have their own four gigabyte allocation area, so those are separate. Even other V8 instances inside of web workers uh, and on other tabs, have their own 4 gigabyte allocation area. So you're only restricting one V8 instance, not all of them. The other big project last year was V8 Lite. And this was, this was a really interesting one because we thought to ourselves, what would happen if we just gave up on performance and tried to just improve memory? How far could we actually get? Like for memory constrained devices where V8 just couldn't run at all without the memory that it needed. Yeah, that's an interesting thought experiment. I guess if you run slowly, that's better than not being able to run at all because you're out of memory. Right, absolutely. The approach that we took was to just look at typical websites and look at what kind of things are ta actually taking up memory there. 40-ish percent was user data. There's not really much we can do about that. Uh, projects like points compression are going to reduce that by a lot. 
but we can't really have any targeted optimizations that reduce the amount of data that users create. And there was this big bucket of other, because there's always a big bucket called other, and we couldn't reduce that either with targeted optimizations. But we did look at some of the uh, top users of memory, and we decided to try and target those. Right. So right off the bat, if you're not worried about performance at all, you don't need to optimize code. That makes sense to me. Absolutely. Um, and if you don't need to optimize code, you don't need to really collect type feedback either, because that's just storing the data that we need for optimization, and it's only used for performance. Even the bytecode that we generate, you don't have to store that. You can just compile it on the fly whenever you need it and get rid of it afterwards. It sounds a little different to me, though. Bytecode is unoptimized code, and if you're even getting rid of that, that sounds like you're giving up more than just a little bit of performance. Yeah, the first prototypes of V8 Lite were pretty slow. Uh, but then we realized that we could get a lot of these gains without actually sacrificing performance at all, just by being a little bit lazier. Yeah, I'm something of an expert at being lazy myself. Yeah, I'm pretty good at being lazy myself too. But as an expert in laziness, you know, right, that being lazy doesn't just mean not doing anything at all. It means not doing anything until you, you're really required to. So we took the same approach with V8. Um, let's talk about those uh, feedback filters that I mentioned previously, the type feedback. You're not going to make get much benefit from type feedback if you only run a function once or twice. It's only really going to start benefiting you after you run it tens or hundreds of times. So we can delay creating this type feedback until we've already had a couple of runs of this function, taking off some of those feedback vectors, but not all of them. Same thing with source positions. We only need those for printing line numbers when we print exception stack traces or for printing uh, stack traces in DevTools. So if we can delay calculating those till later, then we save a lot of space as well. Even bytecode, we have this capability of getting rid of bytecode that we don't need. So we can just get rid of old bytecode, keep around bytecode that we're still using, and save a little bit of memory there. And there were a bunch of tiny projects targeting these top memory users, which are described in this blog post in a lot more detail. But again, spoiler alert, they reduce memory by 10 to 30% on typical websites. Nice. So there's actually been a lot more going on in V8 in the last year. We only really had time to talk about a couple of projects. Uh, I recommend you visit our blog where we post about new versions of V8. We talk about exciting new things that we just like to talk about. It's a great read, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for all the viewers who joined us for this whirlwind tour of the JavaScript, what's new in the JavaScript language and the new developments in the engine itself that makes running JavaScript both faster and to use less memory. We definitely didn't have time to go into all the new features that were added to JavaScript, so please give our blog a read. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.